Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the ETH Global Lecture Series. This series offers a platform for contemporary global topics to be engaged with outstanding global thinkers. In a nutshell, we invite an interesting person or two people or three or four, who knows how many, all of you are interesting on the call, to speak on something very topical and to share their personal insights based on their experiences and expertise. Today, we are incredibly privileged to have two wonderful individuals, wonderful thinkers, and two individuals who are right in there in the midst of helping us understand what the future of learning and the future of work could be, will be, should be. Cynthia Hansen is the chair, the head of the ADECA Foundation, ADECA Group Foundation, excuse me, Cynthia. And um, I'm sure you've Googled her already or you've looked her up on whatever search engine you use and you can lose about a half an hour reading about her. And the same is true with Manu Kapoor, professor at ATI Zurich and especially focused as the chair on, on the future of learning, who's joining us from Singapore at the moment. So we have an internationally present group here. Now, all of us learn. We learn every day. Most of us, hopefully, will never stop learning until the day we die. We also work. Some of us don't consider what we do work. Others do. Some work for love. Some work for pleasure. Some find it rewarding, fulfilling, and for some, it's just a means to an end. And for many, unfortunately today, we can't find it. And the same is for learning and finding the right way to connect, to learn. What does it mean to learn? How do we learn? How could we be learning? What is the future of learning? So today we're going to engage with Cynthia and Manu with a series of conversations, topics, discussions, and also with you, our audience. I ask you to pop your ideas into the Q&A and I will do my very, very, very best to get to them and through them and integrate those into our conversation. And I tell you, I know I have the, the privilege of knowing both Manu and Cynthia and have had various conversations. And I think the, the three of us could probably talk for two days without letting anyone else in. But that's not the intention of our global lecture here from ETH. So, Cynthia, welcome. It's great to have you here. Thank you so much, Chris. And Manu, welcome. It's great to have you fly in. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> nice, to, nice to see everybody. It's great to be here. So, so, Cynthia, I want to start with you. And the question is, when we're thinking about the future of work, how do we unlock the potential for each one of us to be able to work? Or what, what does this really mean when you're thinking about unlocking potential to work? Thanks, Chris. So we've been spending a lot of time looking at, out of all the people who could work, who are the people who are falling out and are not able to work for whatever reasons. And with this idea, of there are these latent pools of talent out there that could be contributing to the workforce, to productivity, to economic growth. And often what's missing is the ability to link the skills, the competencies, the experiences that people have to the kinds of, of needs that the labor market has, or even in terms of language to translate it and to frame it correctly in ways that employers or organizations can understand. So it may be that you have fantastic things in your toolbox, but the person that you're here who's hearing it or the, the AI driven algorithm that's screening your CV mm -hmm. isn't ever going to pick it up. So we're really interested in what can you do to actually reframe what you have to offer and mm -hmm. then map it better to what the needs are out there? One of the examples that we've been working on recently is working with young musicians. So mm -hmm. you get young musicians who have been identified from the age of two, three, four, trained really narrowly, and your whole mission in life is to be the best cellist you could possibly be. And you get to 25 and you find out that across all of the world, there are only a handful of positions available for a cellist in an orchestra. And you need to suddenly look at what else you might do 
in addition to music or instead of music. Mm -hmm. But you say, well, but I could just be a cellist. I know how to do this and nothing else. But actually, if you dig into it, as a musician, you know how to work in a team. You know how to give feedback, mm. how to receive mm. feedback, how to create um, kind of synergies with other people, how to critique your own work, all of these great things that would be applicable for any employer. But you may not have even thought about it in that way. So it's really the framing that's often key to unlocking those pools of talent. So they're really talking there about different kinds of different types of skills, right? Not just a, a work title but a skill set and to appreciate the skill set. Is that correct? Indeed. And, and actually something that we're seeing now is a sea change away from job titles and job descriptions more to role descriptions and uh, seeing a job as kind of a, a, an amalgam of tasks or a fluid grouping of tasks. So it's more not that I am well positioned to be this type of engineer, but actually I bring this skill set and I have this polyvalent ability to take all the things that I can do and apply them to a lot of different kinds of jobs. And that's what you're going to see in the future, rather than it being so focused around job skills, job titles, it's actually going to be you know, a, your array of things that you can do and how you can apply them in different contexts. So, so before I come to Manu to comment on this, what, what, if, if, I'm, if I'm an employer, and in the, in I said that for the past hundred years, someone came to me and said, I'm a cellist or I'm a civil engineer. I would understand in my mind, I would create a picture in my mind what, what, she, what she could do. But what it's sounding like, this isn't the right, this isn't the way it's going to be. Uh, a, a, a title of a degree or is, is no longer going to be the picture that we need to be placing in an, an employee's or an employer's mind. How do, we, how do we understand that when we're looking at the future of work and future of employability? I think one of the things that you'll see more of is a better understanding of the needs and like really spending more mm. time on what are the needs for a particular role or a particular task or a particular project. What do I need around the table in mm. order to accomplish my goal? And so then it's going to be, well, I need someone who's a lateral thinker. I need someone with this kind of expertise. I need someone who is good at synthesis. I need someone who's good at data visualization. So those aren't job titles. Those are an array of skills. So I think what you'll see more is pools of people with different talents who get hmm. configured in different ways hmm. around a particular task or a particular project. And maybe that's something that is not permanent. Hmm. So maybe what you'll see is actually your workforce becomes a pool of talent that you configure and reconfigure depending mm. on what you need. And this is where that idea of different types of employment also makes sense that you may not need to keep that data visualization person on staff all the time, mm. but maybe you need that person in a pool and maybe the pool is shared with other departments or even with other employers so that you can keep that person meaningfully and gainfully employed, but it doesn't have to be in a traditional role under a traditional contract. Mm. That's interesting because you, you just unearthed something which could be the future of work also has something to do with the future of organizational structure. Indeed. Mm -hmm. Aha. Well, we're going to park that one over on the side for just a few minutes because I'm going to want to come to Manu. Manu, you, you, are, you have the chair for future of learning at the ETH. So how, how do you see this when we're looking at skills, work? I mean, what's your take on it? Yeah, so when you when you started with the unlocking of potential, you know, the way a learning scientist would see something, something like that is not to think of it as something you have, potentially something you have, and then you unlock it. Uh, we see it's something that can be developed. You know, if, if, if it's a trade, something either has or doesn't have, then there is no opportunity for us to design the growth or the development of it. So I was, I started to think about learning, how can we develop a certain set of skills and dispositions and people, right? So that's the one difficult, mm. uh, different way of thinking about unlocking potential. Because once you start thinking about developing potential, then you start to say, okay, what kind of environments do I design for people to develop these certain sets of skills? Mm. Cynthia spoke, spoke about fluid set of skills, uh, moving through a set of context and skills. Uh, one of the fundamental problems in the learning sciences is one of transfer. That is, you know, you learn something in one context, say 
I was a football player, so I learned football. Uh, I learned lots of things with football, including working with people and other things, right? Um, and can I can I transfer that to another context where I'm in an engineering design? I was an engineer too, so I have an engineering design team. Is working in a football team the same as working uh, together? Can I transfer something from the former to the latter context, right? So that transfer is incredibly hard. And it mm. turns out from the science of learning perspective, how that initial environment was designed influences how well people can transfer from one thing to the other. So as a learning scientist, oh. I'm interested in, it's not, it's hard because we don't design it well. So if we design it well based on the science, then people can transfer it well. And, mm. and that's what I try to unlock, uh, unlock uh, in terms of, on so, the so, development of potential. So, so can you just explain that a little bit more? Because Cynthia also talked about this, this, this transferal from a cellist to something else. So you, I believe, were also at one point a football player, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. And you've been able to tran you have been able to transfer many of the skills which you've learned. I think Cynthia's also done many different things in your life. What is a good or a well-designed learning environment for that potential to transfer look like? Right. So, I mean, there are several properties of that. One of that is you need a varied set of contexts. Uh, so if I'm going to work, uh, if, I'm, if, if I'm going to play football, then I need to be in a football training context. If I'm going to be an engineer, then the learning environments, as to the extent that they mirror the disciplinary practice of engineers, you know, what they learn would transfer to the engineering practice later on. So there has to be an alignment between the, the context where something is learned and where it's going to be used. And if there is sufficient variability in these contexts, then these skill sets or what we learn become flexible and adaptable as well. Yeah. Interesting. So, that, so does this also transfer into cultures? So different cultural contexts, not just... Mm -hmm. Learning yeah. To, yeah, yeah. So, from a learning scientist standpoint, we, what we design for our cultures, the unit of change, is culture. Hmm. So, you know, we're not implementing a new, say, methodology or a teaching method in a classroom. We're changing classroom culture. Hmm. You're not, you're not trying transforming somebody. You're changing someone's personal culture mm -hmm. uh, and organizational culture, societal culture. The, it's, it seems hard, you know, on, on, on the face of it. But human beings are very malleable, very adaptable. I mean, we already behave differently in different cultures that we operate in here in a more formal, informal culture, at work, with friends, with family. And we switch on and off and adapt very quickly and move, navigate across these things very easily. So we have the ability now, if we can design these cultures at different levels based on the science, then I think we would be able to, we have the facility to be able to navigate. And if you can't, we can support uh, students through that. Yeah, fantastic. I so, would, Cynthia, go ahead. I was, I was just going to build on that for a minute because I think it's about also understanding the other cultures, understanding how to bridge. So it's like literally going into another culture, understanding what the drivers are, what the needs are, what the language is, what the the key triggers would be, and then figure out back to the framing idea how to communicate what you what you have or what you're building or what you want into that language i like that idea of cultures being the unit of change yeah, yeah. yeah. and failure is intrinsic to this so you know True. whenever you want to operate in any in a new context you're bound to fail at something or the other and if the culture is designed in a way or the norms are set in a way where that is expected that is part of learning and that is uh, you know people can grow into it then that adaptability the navigating across different contexts also becomes easier it's so i want to come back to this unit of change uh -huh. I'm, I'm intrigued by that because a unit implies a size uh -huh. and if i think of culture that that's also that's huge i mean culture we saw cultures of multiples and multiples. So it, it, it kind of it, elaborate on that just a little bit more, the, this, this unit of change being the culture. Is it the, the culture of the classroom, of the learning moment? What are some of the parameters for that to be successful? So every, every activity that we take part in is, has a social surround, has a cultural umbrella or an envelope to it. 
you know, if you're at work, there is the organizational culture or department culture or your lab culture that surrounds you, that, that implicitly, explicitly or tacitly guides you in certain ways of behavior, right? So part of the change, when we say the unit of change is culture, is to try to understand what these implicit and explicit rules and norms and expectations are and value systems are, try to align them to more what, what the science would say are more productive ways of thinking and being, ways of being when you're learning something. Hmm. So for example, if you're in a classroom where the teacher only asks, like, you know, here is the way to solve a problem, here's what you need to know, here's how you solve it, learn it, learn it correctly, and go and take tests. That's one thing. Another classroom, you know, a teacher may say, well, here's a difficult problem, you know, try to solve it. You know, it's okay if you don't, if you're not able to solve it correctly, try different ideas, talk to people. And if you're struggling, that is actually good. That is actually a sign that you're in the right space. Mm, you know, mm, uh, mm. if you're finding it easy, you should not be too happy, <laughs> you know, because mm -hmm. then you haven't been pushed. So that's a different, both had two very different cultures. But one is supportive of certain ways of development of work or working with knowledge and learning how to learn something. And the other is quite another way of thinking about it. Which one do we want? The science says in initial learning, uh, the, the more uh, productive culture is the one that affords that exploration and failure. You know? And so we but, design for that. So, but Cynthia, if we talk, from an employer's perspective, because you work with many, ADECO works with many companies around the world, right? I mean, this is partly mm -hmm. what you do. If you see an employee struggling, that's often, uh, employees, I mean, I, I'm just trying to think, I'm trying to, I love the way you said that, I'm going to say, when, when it's someone's struggling, that means they're learning and they're having to adapt. But very often, as an employee, when you're struggling, it can be very terrifying because all of a sudden you're like, I don't know what to do, or I don't know how to do that. Do you, do you, do you see companies accepting this, or do you see they're going, okay, I'm going to put you into what you know how to do because I don't want you to struggle? That's a really good question. I think it's hard to make um, sweeping assumptions course, about yeah, that. No, yeah. um, <laughs> and you, I think you see more of that acceptance in certain industries that are more innovation driven. Um, but at the same time, I think you see kind of microcultures. You'll see it within a, within a team or within a business unit that actually that kind of innovation mindset and the idea that you you test things out, you know that some of them are going to fail, you learn, you quickly adapt, you do it again. Then that actually is something that has caught on quite quickly with with things like agile. And so you you see that those are starting to become kind of trendy as well. Not not that agile is new, but um, mm -hmm. I think if you can actually find little pockets that make people feel supported in the not knowing what they need to do or not knowing exactly what the next step is, then you can demonstrate that there's benefit in that model, and then you'll see that it will scale across an organization and ultimately create systemic change. But I think ultimately it does go back to that idea of creating an enabling environment where people feel well supported, where, and it's not about throwing them into something they can't do, but giving them stretch assignments, but making them feel that they've got some kind of safety net as well. Because yeah. there's some situations where it's okay to say you don't know, and there are others where you kind of, you're, ter you're terrified to tell your boss you don't know how to do something because you're going to lose your job. I mean, this is, this is sort of an interesting thing. Now, let me, I want to pop onto something else because I know AI, so the digital transformation is pretty profound in many domains right now, right? In some parts of the world, it's advanced, other parts, it's not. So this, this digital transformation is amongst us. When those two words, what does this, what do those two words mean, Cynthia, for you when we're thinking about the future of work, digital transformation, the future of work, and Manu, come to you with the future of learning, what do those two words mean for you? So I think there's been so much written about digital transformation and the idea that it, it hinges on automation and that automation then means that people are going to be kind of automated out of jobs. Mm -hmm. But actually that, that is again too big an assumption and actually there's really good research that shows that you know many, many jobs are being created as other jobs are being automated out. And so what it really means is looking at it more as a flow. So what kinds of jobs are going to cease to exist? What kind of jobs are going to be on the rise? Therefore, what kind of skills are going to be needed as well? And to really think of it more as how do people work alongside 
technology. It's this human technology interaction and collaboration. Um, you, you hear now about robots and cobots, the idea that you're going to have a workforce that's actually comprised of humans and machines working together and that there will be things that humans can only do that will never be replaced by machines, things like empathy and intuition, um, judgment. Uh, obviously, you can make AI judge in certain ways, but there are going to be limitations. And so I think it's really about figuring out the human element that will always be part of digital transformation. And back to the 4IR idea that digital transformation and, and kind of the advancement of technology should always be in the service of people. And the, and I'll say and the planet. Let's not forget just and the people. planet and yes. the planet. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> okay. True. Yeah. <laughs> and and Manu, for you, digital transformation, learning, several things. Let me start with a couple. So if you look at the theories of expertise, if you study the experts, experts know a lot of you know explicit knowledge. These are the formal rules, theories, grammar of the domain, things you can talk about, things you can write about, things that are codified. Now. How this intersects with technology is anything that is codified or codifiable will get automated because that's that's yeah. yeah so from a learning standpoint then mm. if our learning environment is basically focusing or largely focusing on explicit knowledge structures then i think the automation the automotive potential of digital transformation is likely to come in there and do that more efficiently and at scale okay and while doing so, incorporate some of the learning sciences mechanisms as well, right? So I think that, but if our learning environment also focuses on tacit knowledge, the coupling of the tacit with the explicit, which is something that really defines high levels of expertise, you know, um, then, mm -hmm. you know, as we start to think about digital uh, environment or dig digitalization and hybrid cognition, how we work with technology to design these environments where explicit and the tacit are coordinated or they're coupled in meaningful ways. A third thing that uh, you know, uh, digital, digital transformation brings to mind is this idea of personalization at scale. Uh, you know, in five, 10, 15, 20 years, you know, we'd be able to uh, personalize learning and not just from a cognitive standpoint, but also from a physiological and embodied standpoint. Uh, to each learner. And I think there's great potential in that. So that's going to happen. We haven't been able to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and finally, the thing that is probably the holy grail and which is going to be a hot, so it's like the commodity of uh, the future is learning how to learn. Mm -hmm. We are surprisingly bad <laughs> at designing learning where students actually learn how to learn, you know. Uh, and that is not a conversation typically that gets uh, that people have. That's not a design criteria or a feature in learning environments, be it in schools and universities. But the, the ability to learn how to learn, that that is going to become really key. Hmm. Can I ask a question off the back of that about this idea of learning at scale and the learning how to learn? How yeah. how do you go the route of that personalization without engineering out the serendipity? Because part of learning how to learn is the ability to make those lateral connections or come up with something that is truly creative. How do you how do you make sure that you don't personalize in the same route of you know Amazon suggesting new things yeah. you should buy based yeah, on the recommendations? That, that's right. So how yeah. do you do that? No, so there are d different degrees of freedom within which you operate. So by personalization, you could uh, what I mean is you can initially lay a certain set of degrees of freedom. You can be relatively open but within a bounded space where students can explore and tinker. Then you can tighten the degrees of freedom because then you want them to assemble knowledge and connect with whatever method that they've tried. So, so what, and then as you go through this path, uh, you know, by increasing or decreasing the degrees of freedom, you know, you will learn that for each learner, there is one, there's a, a desired set of experiences that they need to have that, that, that will lead to productive learning. Uh, and, at scale, we will begin to learn what kinds of sequences of degrees of freedom that we need to design for that are most optimal for learners. So it's not the case where you, uh, personalization means narrowing uh, the degrees. It also means expanding and contracting, but in a way that's consistent with how 
the science of learning. So, so let me follow up on that because this is only to both of you now. One has to do with I'll call it a learning path. The other is a career path. And when I graduated a long time ago, there was a career path that you knew you were going to do this, that, 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 and you were kind of guaranteed you would retire at some point and hopefully, you know, be able to eat a, a few, whatever. So, but today, what you just said, Manu, is the, the, the Holy Grail is a personalized path, which doesn't mean that there is a career path or a learning path, which is mm -hmm. recognizable. Mm -hmm. So, we're going to start from the corporate standpoint. When we see career paths, do we have to kind of re completely reconceive what this means, or is it still something we can be? Or, or is it still something which is a, a valid two words together? I think it's a valid two words. I think the definition and the interpretation will change. So, as you said, it used to be that a career path was. You know, you, you, you study, you specialize, you apprentice, you go into the workforce, and then you go through a set uh, kind of progression, right? Uh, and I think anymore, it's more that you, you identify what, what you like, where you contribute, what skills those are, and it becomes a little more of a flow. So there are varying statistics about how many whole careers people will have, but the last thing I had heard was that it's at least five. Hmm. And what I think you'll find is actually you may have five complete careers, but you can actually draw some kind of red thread. So, you know, I started with this kind of work and I found that what really drove me was actually working in teams. So I moved into this kind of work and I found I liked working in teams. What I really liked was leading teams. And so I moved into this kind of work. And so you'll see that it's a progression, but it may not be a progression of job titles or or specific levels. It might be a progression of what you learn and what you contribute and how you apply that and that that becomes your career path. And I think that's less of a career path and more of a personal and professional development path, which back to what you're saying, Chris, is it may not be that it ends. It might be mm -hmm. as people are having different kinds of work and working longer, then you, it might be something that you do forever. Which, which makes me wonder, yeah. like for many of those many companies and governments, you have classes in grades as you move in, you come in at a zero. And by the time you get to be the senior mucky muck, you're a number 10. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like this this hierarchical vertical ladder is something we have to really rethink, which also includes rethinking compensation. True. You're seeing a lot of you know, work being done now around skill taxonomies and also this idea mm. of you know skills and competency frameworks that are done hand in hand. That's something we use at the Deco Group and many other companies do as well. So that in order to move through the grades, you need to have married skills and competencies, and it's not necessarily tied exactly to your job title. So I think what you see is maybe a rise of that skills and competencies nexus, less tied to actual job titles and more to the idea of career progression. Mm -hmm. So Manu, what's, what, tell me about the mirror in, in learning. So the way I, so the career paths, I would think of this as learning paths. So mm -hmm. one of the things, I work in assessments too, and one of the real challenges, I think going forward in assessments would be to develop something like, let's say a learnability quotient. <laughs> there you go, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I invented a new quotient today. Okay, learnability quotient. I, I think that's, and that's the idea that Oh, if people have traversed, and this is connected to a career, the multiple career paths that Cynthia was talking about, as you go through multiple learning contexts, what you learn and then how and how you use it in the next context, and that also shows your learnability, that you're able to learn new things in new contexts. How do we measure that? How do we value that? How do we design for that? Mm -hmm. um, and because we don't know what the uncertain future. <laughs> Uh, and the kind of problems and uh, careers our students would have uh, in many uh, parts of the industry, right? And, uh, but what we can train them is in this learnability. Like, how do you learn? Yeah. Um, and currently, we don't do that. So, how do you measure that quotient, 
I don't know. I just invented it. So I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Ask me in 10 years. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Three days and you have the answer. I'm just telling you what's important. I'm not, I don't see how I'm going to do it right now. <laughs> I like it. Well, here we go. We have a new research project right here. Let's define the learnability quotient. That is... Yeah. Uh, but it's actually quite interesting to think about that and and how some it seems like you know they never stop learning and others you kind of look and say well I kind of question why did you stop learning you know what 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 motivated you to stop learning right or stop and this is when we look at the future of work very often we're we're talking about this term which I think I want to talk about now is lifelong learning right and and so we can't no one can afford to stop learning if we now believe in this new new direction right so cynthia what is lifelong learning what what do you think so uh, there's a, there's a lot that's um being talked about in terms of lifelong learning and that it goes so far beyond traditional learning traditional education it's really how do you keep yourself um intellectually stimulated and hungry and and being stretched you know, throughout your life, throughout your career. And so I like this idea of flow because lifelong learning can sound linear. You know, you work and you learn, you work and you learn and you reskill and you move up. But I think it's really more of a flow and that you're actually gathering things from all different experiences. And then Chris, you and I were in a conversation recently about you move in and out of circumstances and experiences and you're actually gathering things along the way. And then it's how you distill that and how you frame it, and how you apply it. That's the interesting bit and that idea of skill shapes and how you fit your skill shapes to, to what's needed. So I think this is actually interesting because you talked about people stopping learning, but I would actually suggest that people don't stop learning. They maybe stop understanding what they're learning or stop gathering it mm. and packaging it because you're learning all the time. Mm -hmm. So whether you're, you're working as you know, a, a dishwasher or a seamstress or an engineer, whatever it is, or you're walking your dog or you're shopping for groceries, it, you're learning something all the time. And mm -hmm. so if you can then back to Manu's idea of the learnability, if you can actually learn to hear and see all around you and gather these things as you go and kind of weave it into your story of employability and skills and what you have to bring to the world or bring mm. to an employer, then you're constantly learning. Nobody ever stops learning. You just may yeah. not be conscious of it. It's, it's, it's the cognition of the fact that we're mm -hmm. doing that. That's interesting, Cynthia. The amount of lifelong learning, what does that say to you? Yeah, I, I think I'll second, I'll second everything that Cynthia says and just build upon that. So yes to cool. that. And uh, I think we don't stop learning. I think we get comfortable. And huh. like I mentioned earlier, right? Mm -hmm. Once you get comfortable, uh, you stagnate. And so mm -hmm. and deep learning happens when you're in the zone of, you know, where you're sufficiently struggling with something. And that's where the learning happens. If everything mm -hmm. is moving efficiently, then you're not really learning. It's all automated. It's internalized. You're fluent expert. Mm -hmm. You might be in the flow of your expertise, so to speak. Right. So that's one. Um, second thing I want to add to that is there are uh, with lifelong learning, there is an aging. So biology and <laughs> physiology are coming into the picture. So we are going to start looking at lifelong learning together with health and aging. Hmm, and this would also, yeah, and these sectors would have to come in. We don't, we, you know, we for the for the better part of our history, <laughs> we have, you know, we learn. We go to school, we learn, we work, and then we age. I mean, you know, broadly speaking. <laughs> That's so bleak. <laughs> Ouch. Ouch. No, but we, we compartmentalize these things, right? And then we retire and then we die. No, but with, with, with advances in technology and medicine and the nature of work and the future of work has changed, especially now, these things, these trends are going to converge. You know, mm -hmm. talking about learning, we'll be talking about health, we'll be talking about nutrition, we'll mm -hmm. be talking about technology. So increasingly, being a good learning scientist or being a good, uh, you know, work scientist, or, you know, you have to think of these complexities as one set because people are going through this together. Yeah. Um, and I think that's something that I would add to what Cynthia already said. I think that's really fascinating. I really like where you started, where you started with this, with this, this issue of turbulence versus laminar flow mm -hmm. in the sense because when it's laminar there's there's no challenge essentially that mm -hmm. water that air is just moving in turbulence there's all sorts of things which you're confronting 
And I know this is, I want to go to a question which has come in, which is the role of the virtual versus the physical in both the future of work and I'm going to say for the future of learning is especially as to the future of learning, but I want Cynthia to you to answer that too. What is this, what would you say is the role of the virtual versus the physical, the, the head learning versus the hand learning? Mm. How, do you, how do you parse that, Manu? So advances in learning sciences are actually muddling the boundaries between the body and the mind. Hmm. You know, our human cognition is shaped by our physical form, how we are in the physical world, how we use gestures, how we can use hands, the fact that we have two lids, the fact, the, the fact that we, are, we stand upright and so on and so forth. And we're beginning to understand how bodily states and bodily movements influence cognition and how cognition influences the other way around. So I think we're going to see a merging of these two modalities. And from a learning standpoint, again, the question then becomes, we don't have to just rely on mental mechanisms to design powerful learning environments. We can rely on physical embodied mechanisms. So if I'm going to teach you a proof in geometry, I don't, need, I don't just have to design a nice way of explaining it to you. I can make you move in certain ways that help you develop intuitions that then could become mm. useful for learning. You know? So it's opening up. Yeah. This convergence, it's opening up a lot of new possibilities and a lot of, a lot of new ways of thinking about designing learning. So but it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but I remember that someone, someone taught me that physically taking notes by, by engaging more than one sense, our brain would absorb whatever information it was that one was trying to uh, absorb, what you're trying to learn. So multiple senses help you embed certain learning. Is that, is that, is that a myth? Is that a, like an urban myth or is it, was this true? I, uh, multiple coordinated modalities. So if the, the uh, visual and the audio and the physical modalities, perceptual or haptic modalities are well coordinated and what you're learning is relevant to <laughs> and how this coordination is relevant to what you're learning, then right. yes, it is good. Uh, but up to a point because there's a bandwidth <laughs> right. issue as well. Right? right. Okay. So we can, we can fry our brain just by, by learning. Oh, okay. That's what happened in the 70s. I was wondering what happened. That's, that's it. I was learning. Okay, Cynthia, what about for you? The physical, the virtual, you know, from a future of work standpoint with your people you're working with, is this, is this a topic or? It's very much a topic. And I, I think with the advent of COVID and the fact that the traditional ways that people could interact mm. now have, have changed. Either they mm. can't be used at all or they have, you, you end up mm. with some virtual semblance of it. So you take the Zoom meeting you know, and you know, people are, are frustrated by the fact that you can't sit in a room together and, and have that kind of interaction. But what you can do in the Zoom meeting is make sure that you take time for the chit chat and how are things going and how was your weekend? And you know, what's that picture behind you on the wall? Oh, that was the picture that somebody drew for my wedding, <laughs> things like that. All right, <laughs> this one of my colleagues actually has that, it's lovely. So, uh, mm. you know, things like that humanize it a bit. I think ultimately what you need is to figure out what tool and what type of interaction is suited for what, for what are you trying to accomplish? So, you know, Zoom meetings are fine maybe for sharing information, but if you actually want to have a collaborative process, and you can't physically be together, maybe you need something else. You need mural, you need Miro, you need something, some other way of interacting that will make you move. So maybe you have somebody in one room drawing on a whiteboard and then other people contributing to it, you know, virtually, and then you swap and somebody else is drawing on the whiteboard. So you're physically moving. Um, or you look for ways that you can you can kind of marry technology better. Something I've been playing with for a couple of years, I don't have a way to realize it, is um, if you could find a way to use VR or AR to test manual skills and then verify them, then you would have a way to have somebody physically do something, which means mm -hmm. either you're learning or you're demonstrating that you can do something, but then you are transmitting that know-how to whoever's going to need to verify it or accept that you really do know how to do it. Yeah. So that, that's a very interesting thing. That someone asked a question about this as well. Is like, would you hire a, a pianist to, or a cellist, as you used before, 
who works in a symphony and understands how to work with people to do a job they've never done before just beca because they have this skill which you believe they should have, but they don't really have any credential for it. So how do we do this? Because because mm. right, it sounds great in theory, right? Yep. But but how do you actually truly get that transfer? And because you know at, at ATI we all we want everyone to have sixteen PhDs, and you know they've got to be, shoot, but they could be super thinkers, but they don't have a diploma. So what you're getting now, back to this kind of human machine collaboration bit, is uh, virtual job experience or a virtual kind of job testing. So mm. for example, our, 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 uh, our team in France that runs the Grand École d'Altenance, so it's basically the, the apprenticeship piece in France, mm. actually has um, a, a tool by which, you know, if you're a new apprentice, you can go virtually into what it looks like to work in that office. And so you get a, a sense of what can I in, imagine myself in that office? And I look at this thing and I can, I can look around, I can see what it looks like. I can see what people are wearing. I can see how it's laid out and mm. get a little bit more sense mm. of what it would be like to actually have that job. If you could actually make those things even more lifelike, more interactive, then you could actually get, the point, get to the point where you could take the cellist and say, I, I think you'd be really good in, uh, as the team leader of a customer service team because you can listen to people, you can communicate, you can do this, this, and this. Um, let's do a simulation of what it would be like. Interesting. And, and then you can do it without the fear as mm -hmm. well. It's not, I'm going to take a job that I know I can't do and I'm going to fail and get fired, but rather I've got a chance to test it out and see if I like it and see if it actually suits me as well as does it suit the employer. I think it will come. Interesting. Manu, what's your response to that description which you just heard from Cynthia? Do you approve? Yeah, 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 absolutely. And I think, you know, back in the day when I was in college, we were, you know, some of my friends used to say Sin City and, you know, and after mm -hmm. that it was Game of Thrones. And, you know, there was a time where, you know, some, 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 some of my friends went for interviews and they were actually asking, would you play Game of Thrones? Okay, what's your status in Game of Thrones? Are you a guild leader or not? You no, know, honestly, because if you can do that, if you can coordinate and build a guild and manage that and be successful, that means you've got something special. Like, I mean, I mean, I'm just giving an example. Interesting. You know, uh, and, 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 and same with other, so there are ways of, you know, again, going back to the physical and the virtual, the ways of operating in these worlds or playing in these worlds that require very tangible, you know, important skill sets. Um, the question is one of measurability. Um, mm -hmm. That's one. And second, when I, when I hire people, you know, I always give them a situational assessment. Uh, oh, interesting. Know, all mm -hmm. the time. You know, something that well. is new, something that is hard, something that they need to do it quick, uh, quickly, and something that they would need resources, so they will need to do together. And within a very quick assessment, one can tell how flexible this person is. Um, so you could be the best Java programmer, but if I give you another language to learn and you completely are not able to, whereas another person is not as proficient as a uh, proficient Java uh, programmer, but you know, they show that they can pick up new languages very quickly in certain contexts, you know, for the long run, you want the person who's able to quickly learn and work with others to build, build mm -hmm. things as well. What I always do when I do those exercises though, in, uh, in interview and hiring processes is after you've done the exercise, to say I wasn't looking for the right answer I was looking for how you think and how you approach the problem and how you use the skills that you have and apply them not did you get to the right answer hmm. interesting so there's been a couple questions which you come in around the role uh, uh, more questions around AI okay I think this is something when we're thinking both about the future of work the future of learning you know machine machine learning artificial intelligence is on everyone's mind again. And so when we're thinking about the, the translation of skills in the workplace or in learning, in your view, do you think it's getting better or worse? This is the question I'm quoting. Is it getting better or worse through AI? Right? And so this is, a, and like if you're saying, okay, Cynthia, an AI is going to be able to parse your CV or your experiences. Maybe it, he, the AI, I guess they're neutral. I don't know if they're boy or girl or whatever they are. Um, will be looking for certain things, right? So,
so that also all becomes an inherent bias towards huge, search, huge right? bias. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot of work out there, and and we're actually doing some within the Adeco group as well about AI and ethics, and uh -huh. the the fact that AI, because a AI is neutral, AI just learns whatever you teach it. Then it right. can easily then have inherent bias programmed in. Mm -hmm. So there's one one side on kind of how AI is used to evaluate people, uh, or to assess people, and then I think there's the other side, which is, um, is AI contributing to the disappearance of human jobs, and I would say in that case, no. So we had done a piece of work with BCG a, a year or so ago that was really looking at actually across the spectrum, across all different industries, across all different levels of jobs. What you're seeing is not specifically AI, but advanced technology is actually impacting all of them. And it's not that people mm -hmm. are going to lose jobs, it's that they need different skills. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this comes to a part of another question. So, but Manu, do you have any comment on this, on the, the integration of AI into the, the future of learning? Is this a, a red herring? Is it a real tuna or a big shark? No, no like I said, I, I, uh, you know, the personalization at scale is the holy grail, yeah. uh, you know, but the eth question of ethics is equally important. We don't yeah. want to build, embody AI with our inbuilt biases. Already the world is suffering from it. Uh, yeah. yeah. So here, someone asked a question which I thought was quite intriguing is can we, we are talking about here in the future of our future of learning, but we also have to unlearn certain things. We have to, you know, yeah. it's not just learn how to do something new, but we have to, therefore, sometimes we have to unwind what we understood as quote normal operating procedures. So now we have to unlearn it. Can, and, and I don't believe either of you are an AI expert, but can we imagine a world in which the AI has to unlearn some of its biases? I think you have to then just you have to feed the AI with new new data and new experiences mm -hmm. to maybe counteract. I'm not an AI expert. Yeah, no, uh, not, to, to, just, to counteract or yeah. to dilute the the experience and the data that was biased. Yeah, so that's an interesting one to us to pop at our new AI mm -hmm. center here at the ETH and, yeah, and see how can we help them unlearn and become less biased through there. So that's a good one. Someone else asked, say, hey, and I'm going to actually, lifelong learning sounds intriguing, but I myself am close to 60. And I'm asking myself, is it not okay at a certain age to slow down a bit? Sometimes I feel quite stressed out by people who never stop chasing, who are never quite happy and content. Oh, that's interesting. There's a lot in that question. Yeah. Mm, that's why I picked it. <laughs> I like this idea of like, why do you learn? Do you learn because you're somehow uh, discontent with what you have? Or do you learn because you think there's always something better? Or do you learn because you're just intellectually curious? So mm -hmm. I, think, I think learning when it's intrinsically driven and maybe extrinsically reinforced is good. Learning when it's just extrinsically driven and you're in sort of a panic mode in order to keep up, then I don't think it's as effective. Yeah. Manu, what do you think? When learning is growth, then it's good. When it's not, then it feels a burden. Yeah, so it becomes torture perhaps versus the, the ex expansion. So so here's a, another question that's coming, which I am intrigued by. It says, it seems like over the past few decades, there's been a focus on generalization, on generalists being more successful in the workplace because they're more malleable. I'm interpreting the question a little bit. Where do we see with the future of work and the future of learning specialization versus generalization? Should I take that first? Yes, sure. please. Yeah, so this is an issue of transfer. If you want to be an expert in something, you cannot, I mean, you can't just remain at the general level. So there's no there's no theory of expertise that will tell you you can operate at a general level. No. Expertise means you develop very specialized skill sets and knowledge that differentiate you in very particular and specific ways from other uh, experts or other, other people, right? Or novices and so on. So, so I, 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 I completely rubbish the idea that we can just all be generalists and the world will be okay. It will not. You have to develop expertise. The question is, is your expertise locking you in to a particular way of thinking 
and then obscuring everything that's outside, that you cannot talk to people outside that, or you can't transfer, you talked about transfer, you can't transfer what you know to other contexts, to see the connections with other problems that people could so you could be solving, right? That's the part that's missing. So mm -hmm. if you want to send, you know, uh, the rover to Mars, you need experts in every discipline. You can't sure. put a bunch of generalists and do that, make that endeavor, right? You have a you have to be experts in multiple domains, but they also need to be able to talk to each other. So we want to create experts, or we want to you know, develop experts that have deep knowledge, but that knowledge is flexible so that it goes broad. It, it, it can see connections. It can talk to other pieces of knowledge in other contexts. That's the challenge that we need to take on. I would completely agree. Um, it, people talk a lot about that T-shaped model. I like the idea of like a multi-legged table model. So, you know, you, you, you have kind of the transversal bit. I understand generally how things work. And then I have my areas, maybe two, three, four areas of expertise. Maybe one of the legs is longer and the table tilts a bit. But, uh, you know, you, you, that, I think it's that transversal piece that's important. You need to understand how your expertise then links with others. So you also, you need people who have those skills back to the learnability piece, mm -hmm. but who yeah. have the ability to then specialize in certain things, because that's what the value is that you bring to the table. Mm -hmm. so, so we live in pandemic time, so I'm going to use the viral model. You know, you have the expertise, and it's got pokes in all different directions, <laughs> and it can latch on, <laughs> latch on to. And <laughs> that's true. You just have to have the right protein receptor to find the right place to latch into. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah and but and, yeah. Anyway, we're, we'll stop on the virus thing right now. Right there, <laughs> America. I don't want to go there anymore. So, so, but let me ask you this. So. For for those who listen to this, who are in their twenties or teens, and thinking to themselves, "Okay, in the future I will be working. In the future I will be learning. I will be flowing. Should I start off specializing? Should I start off generalizing and then find a specialty? Whether we're a T-shaped person, a deep T, a broad T, a tabletop, or a coffee table, or conference table." How? What would you say to these these young of years individuals as they're starting that journey? What what advice would you both of you give to them, and who would like to start? I can start. Yeah, because I, I I do a lot of mentorship, um, and I I am probably a little bit biased because I'm the product of a liberal arts education, which is really try a lot of different things, learn how to learn, and then figure out where you want to specialize. Um, so I think that experimentation and, and broad-based learning is really important. The other thing that I'm really conscious of with the folks that I mentor is that just because you specialize, that doesn't mean it's what you do forever. Mm -hmm. You know, specialize because it's something that drives you, something where you have passion and you have something to offer, but know that you can change it later. Back to the idea of having three, four, five different careers in your lifetime, just because you specialize when you're 18 doesn't mean that you might not be doing something completely different when you're 40. Great answer, Cynthia. Thanks, Manu. Yeah, I, I don't think there's a set path. You know, some people are, you know, they they love football or they love cellos, and they, they from the very beginning and they throw themselves into it, and they become the Roger Federer's and the Cristiano Ronaldo's and the you know, mm -hmm. box of the world. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, uh, and others, you know, take some time to figure out things, and you know, they follow a more general path and they figure out, you know, and then over time they lead to specialization. So I think we should to the younger people to say, yeah, figure out what you want and whatever path you're taking, it's fine. So I, I say two things. A, you know, everything should have, should have a sense of purpose to things, you know, so make sure you, your own purpose is clear. And another thing is, the second thing is have a narrative. Always start, always, you know, think about what's your story? <laughs> like, what's your narrative? How would you mm -hmm. describe where, who you are, where you're coming from, where you're going with this? Just, just narratize your, life your work that's a great answer money i'm still trying to figure out what i'm going to do when i grow up you know it's it's uh, the thing one thing i would always advise to these young people would be whatever you're doing do it fully right and this yeah. is or anyone of any age just fully be be there be present fully and i think that's also so um we only have about six minutes left and cynthia what is on your mind right now what are you working on right now that's, you know, anything, but what's. Yeah, so what we're working on right now, 
or what my team's working on right now is how do you build out uh, a social innovation lab and mm. use the ability to bring people together across very diverse backgrounds, industries, sectors, different kinds of expertise and come up with practical solutions. And so in the first case, we're looking specifically at youth and underserved youth, specifically youth and youth who are not in employability, education training, and people who are really falling out of the, the workforce, falling mm. out of the system, maybe not even being counted, then what are the real needs and how might you come up with, with real solutions? So I've been playing around with this idea of nexus and nodes. And so, and I just made this up, but the nexus idea is basically what are the points of intersection and what can you learn at those points of intersection? You know, so between academia and business yeah. or between government and innovation. And then the idea of nodes being basically where you have the collaboration, where you've brought people together to actually do something. So cool. what, what I'm interested in is how do you bring nexus and nodes together? Very cool. Thank you for that. It's, it's extremely important for us to catch. You know, there's so many individuals right now who don't have a chance. They, don't, they haven't found the gatekeeper. They don't even know where the gate is or where a key is. So that's, that's really great. But Manu, what about you and your teaching group, your research group? What's, what's got you excited right now in the future of learning? Well, on the science side of things, it's some of the convergences that I talked about. So, you know, the physiology, embodiment, technology and hybrid cognition and so on. So those are the basic science work that we do. And that's really exciting. Um, on the application or the engineering side of things, you know, I see huge potential, uh, you know, in, in really enhancing practice of education, of learning, if you bring the science into it. That is the challenge of changing cultures. Mm -hmm. And that's been on my mind as well. Well, I hope you crack that. I hope both of you are successful in your these endeavors. These are both super, super. So look, um, it has been a pleasure to have this chat. I mean, truly for me, every time I learn when I speak with either of you individually and together, it's great to see we've invented two new things, just the <laughs> three of us. And those also the over almost 150 folks who've joined us from different parts of the world and their questions. And to those whose questions I was not able to slip into the conversation, I will share those with with Cynthia and Manu and maybe in some of their writings or their work, they might even you might see some things published on some of your questions. So I think there's some really great questions, especially around how do we learn to learn? I mean, this I think both of you mentioned this as being really critical to future success for all of us and how to learn to learn. And I think this is, um, you know, a kind of another holy grail. And culture of the unit of change. It's fantastic. And I also liked hybrid cognition. It's a wonderful combination of two words, which I think we could have a whole afternoon just trying to figure and add out and unpack. And of course, how you transfer skills. So I truly want to thank both of you um, for, on the behalf of ETH for joining us. And I'd like to thank all of you, our guests who have joined us from close and far for making the time to join us for this hour. It is really great that you could join us and we look forward to the next global lecture, which is going to be taking place on Monday, the 8th of March, which is not too far away in two weeks time. It's going to be a fantastic conversation with Iris Bonet from Harvard University and the rector of the ETH Zurich will be Sarah Springman. And we will be having a really great conversation, especially focused around gender inequity. And I do hope you will join us for that day. So now I'd like to say thank you to all of you and stay safe, eat an apple, drink lots of water, go for a walk. If you can, get some sunshine. So thanks, everybody, and have a wonderful rest of day. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Ciao.